day two, keynote getting underway. Chief Research Officer Rick Rashid is taking the stage now. Let's listen in. Awesome accomplishment. Uh, we all here consider ourselves very fortunate to be working in his organization. You know, you can say lots of things about Rick. You know a lot of things about Rick. Um, but really, um, one of the things I really like about Rick's is how smoothly he tells his stories. And so it's our opportunity to welcome Rick, Rick Rashid to come here and share his, th his thoughts on the blending of the physical and virtual worlds. Rick, welcome. Thank you, Harold. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I guess this is now the 13th year that, uh, that I'm speaking at our, our faculty summit event, since as Harold says, this is our 13th event, so I assume that's the 13th year. I've always, I know I've, always, I've done it every year. And uh, you know, I can remember when we, we first started uh, these events, and, uh, uh, and actually for the very first one, I think we had about 80 people, and uh, we honestly weren't sure how many people were going to show up. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, well, if we, if we put this together, can we really get people to show up? You know, are they going to be interested? Uh, and, uh, uh, and much like our TechFest event that also started out when we weren't sure it was going to be successful, you know, this one has become a very successful event over the years. And, uh, and um, this year, as um, Harold has, has pointed out to me, uh, we now have the largest attendance we've ever had uh, and a huge number of people here this year that have never been to one of these events before. So that's really great, too. Well, as long as I'm, uh, uh, you know, reminiscing about the past. I thought I'd also reminisce a little bit about Microsoft Research because this is, as Harold mentioned, this, this year that we're in right now is our 20th year. Uh, we celebrated our 20th anniversary uh, in um, September of last year and uh, we're sort of, we've been playing out our 20th uh, anniversary year for the last uh, few, yeah, last number of months now. And it's, it's interesting to think back on it because when I came to Microsoft in September of 1991, it wasn't really clear, uh, probably to anyone, but certainly not to me, that uh, we would be in the position that we really are today. Uh, we, our, our first location on campus was over in Building 20, which is this squat, tiny little building over on what used to be called the main campus. The main campus has now grown considerably. Uh, and uh, you know, for the first year, we were in Building 20, and it, it, it wasn't necessarily an auspicious location. For some reason, they never torn down Building 20. Uh, it's one of the few of the old, really old buildings that haven't gotten rebuilt. Uh, but uh, so you can still see it over there. Uh, and it was really hard in those early days to uh, recruit people, to really get people to come. Uh, you know, just think about it. You know, in, in your own mind, what it might have been like to try to convince you know, top researchers uh, to come to a new research lab in one in those days was a really small software company, right? We're a relatively small software company. Um, our products were not products that were necessarily used heavily within the academic community. I mean, not a lot of people used DOS in those days uh, in the academic world. Uh, and, the, uh, and it wasn't really clear that we would necessarily, uh, either as a company, grow to the point where we would be large enough to support really large-scale basic research, or, or that even the, our research group would, would last long enough to be successful to do that. Um, to give you a sense of how, how difficult it was to recruit back then, uh, the very first person I called on the phone, uh, and I did this back from my office at CMU, because I, once I'd made the decision uh, to move and I told the university I, and I told Microsoft I was, I was coming, uh, the very first person I called was, was my best friend. Uh, he was the best man at my, at my first wedding. Uh, Dan Ling. And he was a senior research manager at IBM at the time and uh, doing some really great work. So I called him up and I was very enthusiastic and I was kind of hoping at least I could get Dan uh, to sign up you know, right away. And of course he turned me down because uh, he wasn't sure this was going to work. And uh, uh, so if you can't convince your best friend, uh, you, know, it's, it, you, you know you're in for a hard slog okay, on the recruiting side. Yeah, but luckily, I think we were able during that uh, first year or so uh, to really bring in some great people that had a great entrepreneurial spirit uh, and really ha were willing to take the risk, um, not just the risk on a new organization, but also take a lot of research risk and, and to really you know, go out and, and tackle really hard problems. So people like Eric Horvitz, I know Eric spoke here yesterday, uh, David Heckerman, many of you know David's work, 
and eventually Dan Ling. About six months later, I did finally get Dan uh, to join uh, Microsoft Research. And uh, as many of you know, he eventually went on to uh, run the, the Redmond Research Lab for a while. So, uh, so I think it, we were really lucky in those early days to, to get that great group of people, uh, to be able to get people who are willing to take a lot of risk, you know, not just with uh, their careers, but, but with the research that they were doing, um, and, to, and to push the envelope. And we've continued to build on that and build on that over the years. Uh, this year has been, I think, a particularly a uh, great year for Microsoft Research uh, in a lot of different ways. I mean, on, on, the, on one hand, you know, this has been probably the most productive year I can think of in terms of the transfer of ideas and technologies from research you know, into our products. And you're seeing a lot of the fruits of that in things like the new Office release uh, that was uh, just made available in a consumer preview yesterday. A, a number of the technologies in, in Office you know, come out of Microsoft Research. Uh, you're seeing it in the, in the work that we're doing with the Xbox. Uh, there was just a report now that the, the, this is the 18th quarter uh, that the Xbox is the number one selling console in the United States. Um, and really, a lot of the technologies like Kinect uh, the new voice uh, technologies, uh, a lot of the things that, that are in the system, the, uh, a lot of the work in the 3D graphics, networking, uh, all of those things, the user interaction technologies, you know, those are all things that are coming out through a collaboration between Microsoft Research and our uh, interactive entertainment business unit. Uh, so there's just a lot of great things happening just at every part of the company, whether it's in, the, in, in our SQL products, whether it's in our uh, Windows or Office products, uh, whether it's, it's in a lot of the things you don't normally think of. I mean, a lot of the technologies that are used to build Microsoft products, uh, to analyze them, to test them, uh, to uh, detect intrusions and things of that sort, all of those technologies uh, are, are things that come out of Microsoft Research as well. So it's been an incredibly strong year for that, uh, and, it's, and it's continued to drive a lot of the innovation in the company. Uh, but it's also been a year where we've been, you know, especially in the last 18 months, so we've been really expanding in a number of areas. Uh, we just recently announced a new research lab in New York City, and I'm really excited about that, both in having a presence in New York City, but also about the people in that lab uh, doing some really, really great research. Uh, and so that, that's, that's something that's really exciting for us. Uh, but over the last 18 months, we've, we've uh, added groups um, doing advanced uh, development and advanced technology in uh, Germany. We have a group in Aachen, Germany uh, at our advanced technology lab there. Uh, I was just recently in Israel at our advanced technology lab uh, in Tel Aviv. And uh, we have a group in Cairo uh, doing uh, a lot of work in Arab uh, language technologies, uh, but also just broadly in natural language technologies and, and other areas of research. Uh, so there, we have been expanding in a lot of different ways, not just, you know, in the research we do, but just physically, uh, which my wife always complains about because it means I just have to keep traveling more places. You know, just every year we seem to add one more place in my itinerary. At a certain point, it starts to, uh, uh, it's, it starts to accumulate uh, and uh, uh, cause her some amount of grief, but it's, uh, it's okay. I, I've been able to live with being able to spend time in airplanes. Now, I've been reminiscing a little bit about Microsoft Research and the fact that we've you know, grown and changed. I think Tony mentioned the fact that now a, a significant fraction of the research um, uh, that's done in the community actually comes out of Microsoft Research. We publish a significant fraction of the papers published um, in the field of computer science. Uh, but if, I'd also like to reminisce a little bit about the, the field of computing. Uh, I know yesterday uh, there was a lot of discussion about natural user interfaces. Uh, uh, there's some great talks and presentations being done on that. Uh, I guess, uh, Benko did a great uh, session that I guess was extremely well attended uh, on augmented reality. And, and, and I talked to him, he, he, he said he didn't even throw out candy or anything. So, so obviously it must have been a really interesting subject because people weren't there for the free stuff. Uh, so that was, that, you know, that's great. But if you think back, you know, in the old days, it, it was really a struggle. Uh, you know, back, uh, I, I began my career in computer science really in the early 1970s. And, uh, and for those of you who are my age, you can remember the, you know, going in and writing your programs on punch cards, you know, taking them in in a tray, you know, handing them to the, the guy in the white coat that then went back to whatever the computer room was back then. Uh, eventually, sometime that day, or maybe the next day, your program ran. Um, and then 
you know, you'd go back and you'd keep looking for the output and eventually you'd get a little stack of paper, which usually said there was something wrong. Uh, and then you'd have to do it all over again, you know, and your turnaround time was about a day or two um, in those days. Um, that wasn't exactly what I characterized as a natural user interface. Um, interestingly enough, the second computer I ever used, so the first was an IBM 360 65, uh, and that was at Stanford in my first programming class. The second computer I used was a uh, uh, HP 2116. Uh, this is an early mini computer. Uh, and Forrest Basket was teaching an architecture class at Stanford in those days. And uh, there, you literally had to put the boot sequence into the computer each time you wanted to boot. Uh, and you did that just on the front panel switches. Um, after that, you could then run the ASR33 teletype and, and read your real program in from paper tape punch. But uh, again, not exactly what I would characterize as an, as an overly friendly user interface. Uh, you know, gradually things got a lot better. Although one of the things I remember in those early days, because my, one of my uh, uh, areas of research was really in distributed systems, was that in the early days we built these systems, especially the time sharing systems, primarily to interact with people. And one of the things we struggled with was the fact that they didn't interact with each other very well. And so we would, you know, I, I can remember actually writing in, a, in one of my early papers, you know, talking about the fact that we needed to make sure that the that the network interfaces and the APIs into our systems allowed computers to interact with each other uh, at least as completely as they interacted with users um, and individuals. Um, and again, it's hard to think back on the days when that was a, a, a struggle, but it was a struggle at one point. Um, of course, then you had the, uh, the sort of early beginnings of how do we really make our systems communicate you know, you know, or, or understand the natural world. Uh, a lot of people don't remember this, uh, some people do. Uh, my PhD thesis was actually in uh, one of the early theses in um, uh, being able to decode th uh, 3D positions in uh, moving images. And it was a real struggle to do that type of work in the mid-1970s because we just didn't have the hardware. Uh, I would make Super 8 videos <laughs> of, uh, of people moving around. Uh, initially, it was just my girlfriend uh, with little white things on her, um, on her joints. I would then scan it in with a, with a single point at a time scanner. You can imagine how long that took. Uh, and then attempt to, to run algorithms on top of that in order to, to find the motion that was in the images. Uh, of course, now, in, you, in some of the sessions we had yesterday, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about a completely different notion of what it means to, to have the computer interact with us. We've gone from these days when we were, when basically the computers were deaf, dumb, and blind, and we were sort of communicating in what could be described as a reverse braille, right, as you typed on these old teletypes, um, to today our computers increasingly have the, the, the senses that we do. In fact, to some extent, they're, they're increasingly having senses we don't have. Right? They, they, they know more about the environment around them um, than we do. Uh, they're more connected. Uh, they, they have better, better uh, resolution in their, in their senses than we do. And that's changing the way we think about sort of uh, factoring what is sort of virtual and what is real, what is human and what is digital. Uh, I think the big change that I think uh, has occurred in the field uh, in terms of people's perceptions, and, and not just you know people in the in the computer science community, but, but people in the broad community <coughs> that really changed people's uh, perceptions was the introduction of, of Microsoft Connect, because that was the first time for ordinary people that that they suddenly realized that the computer could see them. Um, and could see what they were doing and, and, and could understand their motions and their movements. I, mean, I remember when my, my uh, uh, two young boys, they're now 11 and 13, but this was a, f a few years ago, when they were first uh, uh, experimenting with Connect because we were on the beta program, you know, just seeing what it was like for them as they were playing these games where everything they did was translated into the motion of a character on a screen uh, and for me, the aha moment was to see that they not only enjoyed playing the game,
but they were having just as much fun winning because once they'd won, they could jump up and down and celebrate and their character on screen was jumping up and down and celebrating too. And for them, that was as much fun. That was a, a huge reward, right? And you could see that they had mentally projected themselves on this virtual character uh, and that they had made that connection and that was what made it exciting for them. That's what really made it fun. And, and, and I think it's this notion that now, you know, we have the ability because we've given these computers the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to know where they are, uh, to open up new possibilities in the way we think about what computers do for us. Now, uh, a bit more than a year ago, uh, Microsoft Research actually did the first version of the Connect SDK. And our goal there was to try to provide to the academic community um, and, the, and the broader community the opportunity to actually begin to, to realize the value of those kinds of interactions with computers and to give people the ability to program the Kinect on, their, on, on PCs to do interesting kinds of applications. Uh, this last February, the commercial SDK uh, went out and the uptake on that has just been absolutely amazing. I was, as I said, I was in Israel not that long ago. Uh, the number of companies that were building uh, applications around the Connect SDK was really, really uh, surprising and, and exciting to me to see. I'm going to show you a video uh, of the, uh, uh, some interesting work that's being done with Connect, uh, taking advantage of that commercial SDK. So can we run the video, please? Now, this is actually an application uh, uh, built by Nissan. Uh, this, the idea is to use this in, in showrooms or to use this in auto shows. I think. We're